Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with master bassist and educator Anthony Wellington. He came through Kansas City on July 9, 2018 to play at the Black Dolphin and talk to Neon Jazz about his life as a musician and educator that has taken him around the world in a variety of capacities, including being the second bassist in the Victor Wooten Band. He has a very unique approach to the bass called Bassology, He's a very deep cat with a lot to say, so please get to know him and dig this interview, my friends. So, Anthony, right up front, the show was wonderful last night, the Black Dolphin. It was a little bit of a different kind of vibe than I'm used to, but it was so cool to hear the stories. I don't, I don't know that I will ever get the imagery of Prince walking down a hallway out of my mind in my entire life. <laughs> I mean, that, that right there, you, you wove together a Rockwellian... Uh, a, a painting that will never go away. <laughs> oh, I'm, glad. I'm glad. Yeah, yeah, it's cool for such an iconic figure in music. But hey, man, thank you for coming to Kansas City. Thank you for bringing your skill base, especially as an educator and a musician. And thanks for your time, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's an honor for me, man. And I, a lot of times when I'm coming to Kansas City, and it hasn't been a lot, but most time it's been on tour and tour bus, so we're just in and out, you know, in for the day and out for the day. So being here for this camp allowed me to be here for a week, and so we got to eat some barbecue and meet some people and see a little bit of the city. That's always exciting when a musician gets to hang around the town a little bit. Every time a musician comes, the first thing that comes out of their mouth is barbecue, so I'm glad you got to get some of that savory. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, think, I think we're going to do some tonight also as, like, a, as faculty. We're going to go to a barbecue place. Get all you can when you're here, man. It's all good, yeah. for sure. <laughs> you grew up in D.C., correct? I did. Mm -hmm. Okay. So talk to me about a little bit about how you got into the bass, how you got into jazz, and how you became a force in music. Yeah, my story is a little different than most people because, like, you know, I'm a father. I was born in the mid-60s, so I'm a product of music of the 70s. And, and, and at that time, you know, R&B music, what we refer to, uh, unfortunately, we put music into two categories back then. We called it black music, or we call it white music. But at the time, R&B music, which they refer to as black music, it was driven by the bass. If somebody says, come, stay with the heaven, you're going to hum the guitar part. But if somebody says, come, brick house, by the common road, you're not going to hum the guitar part. You might even not know even what it is. You're going to hum the bass part. So a lot of that R&B music, you know, brick house, and I want you back, the most identifiable part of it song was the bass line. I lived in this neighborhood in D.C. that didn't have bands. Unlike a lot of neighborhoods, they didn't have bands because everybody played bass, so you couldn't form a band, but they would get together weekly at this guy named Andy's house, and they would just learn all these cool bass lines and show each other bass lines. And even though I wasn't playing, Andy lived in the same apartment building that I lived in, so I went, and I started absorbing all this bass early on before I was playing. And so, and that went on for years, and then when my family moved to another neighborhood, it was a neighborhood that had bands, and, it, and there, there was these 13-year-old kind of hotshot musicians that were doing some regional playing, a little bit of touring, and I kind of lied and told them that I played bass. I didn't even own a bass, but I had been privy to these bass parties, if you will. And so the guy that my older sister started dating owned a bass that he wasn't playing, so he let me borrow it. And I started playing with these guys and figuring out bass lines really fast. And we were doing a lot of prominent playing. So my introduction to bass was just going to, like, bass get-togethers or bass parties. And so as I got better and better, and I progressed pretty fast, I wanted to get serious about bass. And my heart and soul is still in R&B and funk, but I knew that if I wanted to get serious about it, I needed to at least study jazz. So I started checking out checking out all the jazz guys, especially once you play the electric, like Jaco Pastorius and Stanley Clark, and I thought, to the degree that I could, I started learning a lot of their material, and then some other prominent, well-known funk players like Marcus Miller, and so I didn't really start getting into jazz because I really wanted to be a jazz musician, I started studying jazz because I knew it was going to be probably the best training for me, and, 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 and even to this day, Joe, that's how I look at myself, I don't really look at myself as a jazz musician, I look at myself as an R&B and funk musician, and get a chance to play jazz and fusion and rock. My funk and R&B indeed was ingrained in me, so even when I'm playing all those different genres, there's a little bit of that funk, R&B, and go-go from my background and everything I play, which I think makes it different and makes my playing unique. 
you know, it's interesting you mentioned, you know, getting into jazz because you wanted to become a better player. And I, I run into that a lot with cats that, like, got trained in the jazz arts and then kind of crossed over into other ones. Like, for instance, you know, the drummer for the Smashing mm-hmm. Pumpkins, Jimmy Chamberlain, was trained to be a jazz musician, but he got into rock. And I guess my question is this. It just proves the power of jazz. You know, you, you learn this to become a better musician. Do you think that's appropriate to say with the jazz arts? Yeah, I think because jazz is the, the idiom right now that's, that's associated with improvising, meaning creating on the spot. When, when a lot of times, like when you hear a rock band, when you hear a record of a rock band, a lot of times those guitar solos, those great guitar solos, those, you know, rock records were rehearsed. So they were like more of a part as opposed to an improvisation where somebody just hit the play button and they just started really playing. Those parts will work out. And when you hear a classic jazz record, you're actually hearing somebody being creative on the spot. That's the gift from jazz. You study enough harmony and theory in a lot of the traditional European harmony, but to do it, to be able to do it on the spot. And, and for me, the, the big thing to take away from that is all music is about improvisation. And people misinterpret the word improvisation because they think it means soloing. But improvisation just means creating on the spot, meaning it wasn't there and now it's there. Every song that's ever been written started off as an improvisation. It wasn't there. Somebody came up with a bass line in the brick house, and that's, then the next thing you know, it's an iconic bass line. And we kind of always forget that it didn't exist at some point. Somebody improv that line. And so, and with, with studying jazz, the core of it is, you know, improvisation, knowing how to be creative on the spot. Even if they're not taking a solo, if I get hired for a studio session, somebody wants me to create a bass line on the spot because we can't use a bass line that's already been recorded because that's copyright infringement. So I've got to improv a bass line. So when you're studying jazz, you're studying improvisation. You know, um, and improvisation is, you know, composing, speed it up, you know. Absolutely. Um, so talk to me yeah. about how big the experience with Victor Wooten has been in your career. It's huge for me. I mean, when it comes to musicians, you know, knowing him as a musician and working with him as a musician and as a friend, and I'll go as far as say that I have an apprenticeship under him, you know. Like Yoda said, two there always are, a master and an apprentice. And I think I, I think of this as like a 20-plus year apprenticeship under him. And even though we're contemporary in age, I've learned so much of not just playing bass or playing music, but just about the music industry. I've been privy to sit in on business meetings with record companies and stuff like that. I understand the structure of touring now. So it's not just a base of shit, but just music in general. And he's a, he's a wise person. He's a good friend. So, you know, life lessons also. I mean, knowing him definitely has changed the trajectory of my life. Like, my life would be very different right now. And I don't think in a better way. It would be very different if I didn't know him. So having him in my life and being able to hang out with him yesterday, out of the blue, it just so happened that this workshop and that gig corresponded with him playing in town the same night. And I think we have that kind of synchronicity. Things like that happen quite a bit, even when I'm not on tour with him. We spend a lot of time together with the camp. So honestly, man, my vocabulary is, is really too limited to express to you how what he means to me and, and how much he's affected my life in a positive way, like, there's nothing I could say that could really do it any justice. I don't even know what to say other than that, you know, my life would, wouldn't be the, the great life that I'm living if, 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 you know, he wasn't in it. So I'm just very grateful. I think that statement, I think that, that shows the enormity of how you feel about it, for sure. So your your career is based on the universal language, which I love the, that you said that, and that that, that was a reverberating uh, word that you used last night. So I want to ask you this. You've gone from Washington, D.C., you're in Kansas City now, you've gone all over the world celebrating this universal language. So I want to ask you this. How do you feel about your career? I mean, just even the vignettes of story you were saying with Prince and all these things, you've been all over, you've met so many interesting cats. How do you feel? I feel great about it. Um, first, I'll say this. I've probably played music. I've played music as a living for money in probably, I think, 46 or 50 states. So that's the overwhelming majority of the states. And, and there are, I think, 196 recognized countries on this planet. 
I've played music in, in 30 of those countries. So when you think about 196 countries, that's really not a lot. But 30 is way more than most people, you know, would get a chance to visit. And I really, I feel really extremely lucky that people will pay me and fly me around the world to play music and, and teach. So, but, you know, I still got about 160 more to go. <laughs> so I'm looking, I'm looking forward to that. But um, I, I have to admit that I'm, I'm, I, my career and my life largely is a victim of circumstance. And what I mean by that is I'm not smart enough to have planned it this way or to turn out the way that it did. You know, a lot of it was studying and practicing and luck and timing, being in the right place at the right time, you know, like how it is for a lot of people. But I can't really take credit like I orchestrated it and I knew that this was going to be a career, the career that I chose. When the opportunity presented itself, I just happened to be there for a lot of times. And, you know, like I worked with Victor at this camp. And I, I started out as a helper because he didn't know I was a good teacher. And somebody didn't show up one day, and he said, well, here's your chance to show him what you can do. And then people started coming back to him and said, that's the best music lesson I ever had. So I was already available to him. I was already at his disposal. He just didn't know until a certain fan presented itself. And, like, a lot of my life has gone like that, Joe, just, like, being there for whatever reason. Um, you know, I didn't know Joe Hamill. I didn't know, sorry, Johnny Hamill before this camp. I met him when he picked me up at the airport on Thursday. But for some reason, through a lot of different channels, my name got back to him, you know, as somebody who was a good educator, a good player, and somebody who cared about music, you know, um, and not just offering up good dexterity as music, but who cares about music and and, and is 100% honest about music. And that's, that's what I would rather be, you know, an average musician that plays 100% honest than being a great musician that's not playing 100% honest who's just offering up tons of dexterity and calling it music, just moving their fingers fast and calling it music. And so I think people see that in other individuals at its core that this person is musical first. Because I know some people, like I said, I know people who are average musicians, they're average musicians, but they're great bass players. So being a great bass player doesn't mean you're going to be a great musician. Because musicianship is a communicative part of it. So you can be a great bass player and have tons of dexterity, but communicating with, with other musicians in the audience may be hard for them. They're not good at it. And then I know some bass players who are average players, but they're great musicians. And you see them interacting with other musicians and interplay with the audience. And that's what musicianship really is, not just technical dexterity. And so I think people see that in me, that, that I'm, I'm choosing to be musical first and not choosing to just offer up a bunch of fast notes and call it music. Absolutely. Well, it's funny you mentioned Victor picking you. I think about what happened last night, a genuine uh, moment of improv where you pick Ryan Lee to play the drums. That, that reminds me. You, just, you can just see it in somebody, and you, you gravitate towards it. Yeah, and, and as soon as I met him, and I just met him yesterday, as soon as I saw him, I, 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 I can see musicality in people. I can see it in how they, the genuine smile on their face, how they walk, you know, how they carry themselves in, in, in humility, and I could see that he was a very humble dude, and I could tell that he cared about the art form. Um, you know, it's, for me, it's not about arrogance. It's because being extremely good at something, being great at something, doesn't give you an excuse to be an asshole, and a lot of times we get that with musicians, just because they're, or athletes, just because you're great at something, it doesn't entitle you to treat people bad or treat people without respect. And, and true musicianship, when somebody is honoring the music and honoring the instrument, and like I always tell my students, honor the music first, honor the instrument second, and then yourself third. Don't put yourself first. And I think a lot of musicians, though, put themselves at the top of that list. And a lot of athletes put themselves at the top of that list. And for me, it's about the music first and honoring the music. If I get a chance to play on a great recording and people don't even know that it's me playing, if I honor the music, I feel good about it, you know. And I, you know, I know the history of my instrument. I'm always honoring the instrument. You know, most people don't even know the history of the bass. And they say they want, you know, that bass to provide a living for them and take them around the world. But they don't know that the first electric bass guitar was sold around Halloween of 1951, you know. For me, when you honor the instrument, you know everything about your instrument. I know that I had 11 Gs on my bass on the G string, a 24 fret, 12 fret, open string on the D string. 17th fret, 6th fret on the 8th string, 22nd fret, 10th fret on the E string, 15th fret, 3rd fret, on the E string, 20th fret, 8th fret. And I'm sitting in a coffee bowl without a bass in my hand, but I know where all the notes are. I'm honoring the instrument, and I'm honoring the history. And like I said, I think that's the thing that people see 
even without having to verbalize it, they can tell that there's a high level of caring and honoring music and honoring the instrument, even before myself. I love that answer, man. So last but not least, I'm going to let you get back to your Kansas City venture here, and I want to ask you about bassology. You are just as gifted as an educator as you are a musician, and I want to know how passionate and how much this means to you and what you do with this. Well, well first of all, I'll say that music, music saved my life. There was a period of time in my life where my life was dark, and I was not doing so. I was getting in trouble with the law and um, and, and, and this and like this. You know, I'm a poster boy for second chances and, and rediscovering music because I had got away from it. Rediscovering music saved my life, and if I hadn't rediscovered music, I don't know if I would be alive right now. So, and, and when I rediscovered music, that's when I wanted to know everything that I could about her and everything that I could about my bass. And on that quest to find out as much about, you know, her as I, as I could, that true definition of love is not just a physical relationship for me. And most people see, you know, music and bass or instruments as a physical relationship. And the thing that happens with physical relationships is that if it doesn't turn into love, it all fizzle out. You know, physical relationships are human. If they don't evolve into love, they fizzle out. They end. And, and, and true definition of love is knowing all that you can about that thing that you say that you love. And so I was on that quest to learn all that I could about that, about that entity that I love that I call music and for days. And then as I started to learn more and more, I wanted to share that. And I wanted to share that with people who also said, you know, I love her. You know, I love her. If you love her, know her birthday, know her social security number. That's what love looks like. You know, all of the strengths and the weaknesses. So I love music. And I want to know all that I can about her, and I want to share that knowledge with anybody who's interested in listening. And so, faithology was easy for me because, you know, once I developed the curriculum, that there were I saw that there were a lot of like-minded people. There were a lot of people who weren't like-minded and just think of it as a physical relationship, and that's fine. Physical relationships can be fun, like I said, but they just don't last. But there were a lot of like-minded people who just wanted to know as much as they could about her, and I just wanted to help with that knowledge. So basically, was easy for me. I'm just as passionate about teaching, probably a little bit more the older I get. You know, I'm 53 now, and I don't want to be, you know, I'm not doing the nine to ones anymore, the ten to twos, because, you know, there's only one place where a 53-year-old man could be at 1 a.m. and that's in his bed with his girl, you know what I'm saying? So, so <laughs> that's a young man's game, so I got to spend less time in doing the nine to ones and ten to twos education has become a big part. I go in this camp and doing baseballs, and I do a lot of clinics. If I do a clinic, you know, 3 to 5, I'm done at 5 p.m., you know, and I can be in bed at 10.30. Baseballs was a no-brainer in a lot of ways. I I have knowledge that I can share, and it allows me to operate as close to regular business hours as possible. So I love that. Beautiful. Anthony, man, again, thank you for your time in Kansas City. Great show last night. Good luck with everything you do. You're an exceedingly cool cat, and I appreciate your time, man. Okay, thank you so much, man. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in New York, Washington, D.C., Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to Anthony for making Kansas City a cooler place with his presence, the music, and his time. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store. Visit Neon Jazz at YouTube.com. And for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.